You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 222, Trees and Kings with Rusty Osborne. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing this week? Pretty good. Pretty good. Busy as usual, but it's been productive. Yeah, absolutely. And every week that goes by, it we inch closer to the Naked <laughs> Bible Conference. So I'm excited. This episode's going to give you a taste of what to expect at that conference. Yeah, it's, it's it'll be good prep. Be good prep for people. And we, you know, we still have some tickets left. So again, we're hoping that, you know, the, the interview today, again, will not only prep people who are already coming, but again, get, a, get some other people interested. They are, they are disappearing. So now's the time. Absolutely. I think we have about 50 left. So please go to nakedbibleconference.com and get your tickets. And I'm excited to uh, talk to Rusty. Yeah, I am too. I think uh, our listeners are going to be really interested in what he has to say today. Well, we're here with Rusty Osborne. That's not his real first name, but that's how I know him. Uh, <laughs> William <laughs> Rusty Osborne. And, you know, I've, I've, I've t- had a number of talks over the years, at the academic conferences with Rusty about his work, which we're going to talk about in broad strokes today, because he is one of our speakers at the upcoming Naked Bible Conference, where he will drill down uh, on some specifics. Uh, specific passages uh, related to what we will talk about today, but I've I've kind of followed his work. It's uh, his, his book that was just published is entitled "Trees and Kings: A Comparative Analysis of Tree Imagery in Israel's Prophetic Tradition and the Ancient Near East." And I've mentioned it several times, Rusty. That we went through Ezekiel. Of course, you get to some of that material and the, all the weird, you know, tree images. You know, you're you're like the, the 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 trees in the garden of God and all that kind of stuff. So there's there's divine counsel stuff in there. Rusty is is very familiar with uh, the kind of content that um, you know I traffic in that we mentioned on the podcast that we we write about. And so once I found out what he was working on, I was really interested because honestly, there's not a whole lot uh, done in this that's not in in what we academics would call the fugitive literature. You know, some <laughs> Scandinavian press or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot. So it was exciting that you were working on this. And it's great that you can be here, to, again, to introduce the audience to your work and sort of prep them uh, for what we'll do at the conference. Uh, and, you know, wh- whatever we can do to, again, to help people contextualize scripture, that's that's what we're about. So, Rusty, I w- I'd like you to introduce yourself uh, to the audience uh, to begin with, and then we'll... We'll start talking about your work. Yeah, thanks, Mike. It's it's great to be with you and to to talk about this. I know we've chatted a few times at conferences over the years, and it's kind of nice to to have the the volume finished and be able to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, like you said, uh, my name's William Russell Osborne, so my parents named me, but I go by Rusty. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, I studied um, at Southern Seminary, did a PhD at, at Midwestern Seminary in Kansas City. Um, and really, the the tree work came as part of my, my PhD research. I currently teach as an associate professor of biblical and theological studies at College of the Ozarks in southwestern Missouri. And uh, serve as a pastor of Christ Covenant Church there in Branson for the past year, um, and uh, yeah, so it's a little bit about me. And I teach. Uh, I was just going to say I teach um, Hebrew, Old Testament. Um, also do some Greek, um, teaching some biblical exegesis courses. Actually, just finished a class this past semester on Ezekiel, so we got to uh, spend there a good go. bit of time looking at some some tree imagery in Ezekiel and. <laughs> I think my students may have got a little bit more than they bargained for on tree imagery in Ezekiel, but well, they, they didn't they didn't complain too much. Yeah, well, you know, they're they're captives. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, at least I didn't make it a textbook, right? I was kind. I didn't. Yeah. Uh, but uh, well, it, it's good to uh, to disabuse them of the the thought that they already know all this stuff. That's right. Yeah, yeah. The, the more of that we can do, the better. 
Well, well, let's let's jump in at this place. Let's just start with ancient Near Eastern kingship because that's you know obviously I think of kings and trees. Okay, the you know kingship and and tree stuff. Kingship's probably more uh, familiar to the audience. They're used to be you're used to thinking about kings because you run into those in the Bible and they do stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that all has a context. Yeah. Kingship doesn't just sort of come out of nowhere, and the Israelites didn't just invent it. So tell us a little bit about, you know, the, the trappings of ancient Near Eastern kingship. I mean, what, if you study kingship, what kinds of things do you need to be thinking about? What kinds of things come up uh, in the discussion? Yeah, no, that's great. And, um, you know, just before I start, I mean, one of the reasons that I, I titled the book Trees and Kings was because, I mean, there's a lot of tree imagery mm-hmm. in the the Bible. But really, um, in this volume, I wanted to focus on the intersection between tree imagery and royal ideology, or mm-hmm. that is, how did people think about um, kings? How did they think about yeah. the, the leaders in their various cultural uh, scenarios and cultural contexts? And so that's really kind of what I'm honing in on. And obviously, as you just said, I mean, kingship and, and how we think about kings in the ancient world is intrinsically tied to that. And, you know, I think perhaps there's nothing more foreign to modern Americans than notions of ancient kingship. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a huge idea, but um, this divide is, you know, a massive worldview chasm that we must get over if we're going to understand many texts in the Old Testament, because there was no compartmentalization in the ancient world when it came to politics, religion, and agriculture, interestingly enough, um, that all of these concepts were intertwined with great complexity. So unlike our you know, modern notions of politician is radically separate from religious leader, is radically separate from farmer, I mean, in the ancient world, there was just far more complexity complexity and interconnection in these spheres of life that brought these kind of figurative portrayals of kingship and uh, um, fertility of the land and political power and opulence, and all of this is rolled up together. Um, I think uh, Dan Block and Chris Wright just give such a good kind of visual summary of kingship in the ancient world when they draw this triangle. And, you know, the deity is at the top. People is at one lower corner and land at the other corner, and the king stands in the middle of all three of these realities. Mm -hmm. The king was the greatest religious figure spanning the gap between heaven and earth. The king was the greatest of his subjects of representing the people, and the king's reign was also connected to the fertility of the land. Um, So I think when we think about kingship, we have to recognize that we are looking at, you know, the human being par excellence in whatever cultural context we're encountering, whether it's Egypt, Mesopotamia, Ugarit, um, that we're looking at this human, sometimes divinely human figure that encapsulates what it means to be the best of us. Um, and he serves this a, a unique role uh, in representing that people to the God or to the gods, depending on that context. So, I mean, I think all of those aspects are incredibly important in thinking just about kingship in the ancient world um, as we start looking at, okay, now how did people in this ancient worldview then come to portray kingship visually and literarily? Well, let's pull out a few, you know, a few of those ideas. You mentioned fertility. Mm-hmm. The fertility of the land. You know, there's also this, you know, how do we, how do we look at the king? Is he, you know, a, essentially a divine being, you know, spawned by the deity or is he made, you know, of, of some quality that's superior to the rest of us? You know, those are, those are related, but different concepts. So you, you have, it's, it's, let's, let's just call it parentage or, yeah. or lineage. You've got fertility we we don't really need to even go further than that because you know you you sort of can drift off into military stuff and and whatnot but let's just focus on those two things how how would an ancient person think about either of those or both of those 
both in a way that would be quite different from the way we look at things yeah. and even different from each other. And, you know, like, you know, give us the lay of the land there and then sort of, sort of where the Israelites, you know, sort of drop in or, 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 or pop up from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think a really good place, um, to, to hone in on and, and kind of getting just a, a great picture of all of these ideas coming together is really in, um, in ancient Egypt, around mm -hmm. the time of the the New Kingdom, we see this ceremony with what's called the the Ished tree. Um, and if you're familiar with uh, kingship in ancient Egypt and just kind of the life cycle of how they lived in Egypt on the Nile, there was an annual flood that would come, and and Osiris was a god that was associated with the fertility of the land, and he had um, this this kind of uh, reincarnated visage on earth that was Pharaoh. And so Pharaoh was very, very intrinsically tied to the Egyptian pantheon. And um, as Pharaoh did his job maintaining Ma'at in the world, that is kind of uh, cosmic order, when all was well, the Nile would flood, the land would become fertile, the people would farm it, there would be good crops. And, um, you know, that that was that was kind yep. of the the rhythm of life, right? Yep. And and life the king, was the way it was supposed to be. That's exactly right. And the king stood in the middle of that. And so, you know, when life was good, he was great. When life was bad, he was the problem. Or you know, he needed to identify something else as the problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> so often happens. Um, but you know, at that point, the king comes to, um, to this position of uh, this kind of center centerpiece between the land, the fertility of the land, the gods, and the people. And around the um, the New Kingdom, we have these wonderful kind of iconographic scenes of the pharaoh being superimposed over a tree, which is in the Ished tree. Uh, we don't know exactly what um, type of tree. Some have uh, – um, kind of speculated that maybe it's a Persia tree or something like that, but the king is superimposed over this image of the tree with the gods, specifically Thoth, inscribing the name of the king on the leaves of the tree. And this kind of symbolizing iconographically, visually, how the king's reign is to be as long and productive and fruitful as this tree. And so these, these kind of images of fertility and stability and long reign and connectedness to the deities is all kind of visually wrapped up in that one a wonderful image that becomes uh, quite common even down through the the Ramesses the the second Ramesses the fourth. There's several iterations of that scene, especially like at the temple at Karnak and, and other places. Now you're you're as an Egyptian, you're buying into this because of what? What have you been taught about the gods and kings? Why well, is this meaningful? Yeah, I mean, you've been you've been taught that the king is the descendant of the gods, and that he is one of them, and that he uh, spans this gap between heaven and earth, and um, and and is this uh, the the presence of the the deity on earth that maintains world order and keeps all things established, and mm -hmm. as long as everyone is kind of contributing and doing their part, then the world continues to function. Uh, so I think it's it's very much tied up in an in an just a uh, an enormous worldview, right? That that it shapes and answers many questions and um, explains the reality that the ancients were experiencing day in and day out. Yeah, yeah I, th I think maybe the closest analogy. I mean, if you have a better one, you know, chime in here. But I think for the average, you know, Christian Bible reader. Bible student, it, the closest analogy may be Messiah, you know, the, mm. the, the returned Messiah with the new earth, you know, that, that there's something about that event and that person that returns things to the way they, that they are supposed to be. But, you know, for an ancient person, like an, an, an Egyptian, that was kind of like an, an, an annual re-up, you know, you, you mm -hmm. know you'd, you'd hit the reset button every year to both maintain and restore and continue those kinds of conditions, you know, through different rituals and whatnot. So is that a reasonable analogy? Messianic yeah, thinking? absolutely. I mean, I think so. I think that we see, um, you know, I don't, I don't 
want to to drift too far astray down the path of you know Jungian archetypes or any, anything like this. But yeah, you know, I mean, I, I wrote an article one time on um, the you know ancient kings and Doctor Who. Uh, I mean, there I, I think there is something intrinsic in in humanity that recognizes that we need someone who is l- enough like us to represent us and be interested in us, but we need someone outside of ourselves that is able to do what we sense that we cannot do. And so from the past to the future, we're looking for someone that represents us but is not like us exactly because we recognize our own deficiencies. We need someone other than us but similar. Mm-hmm. And I think that you see um, that just – that 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 idea regurgitate over and over and over and over and over again in the ancient world, um, looking for someone to be the best of us, to you know, go before us uh, with the deity and uh, intercede for us. You know, it's it's interesting. You know, in in a godless culture, let's just say, yeah, you know, an atheistic culture, you know, that that wants to sort of meet the same needs. In other words, the the the, the human the human psychology doesn't change. Uh, they're still looking for those things, but instead of a person who is most like us, you know, to be some sort of divine representation. Now, now, now we have the state, the, you know, collective. The collective is yeah. better. All of us is better than one of us, you know. And you can see how the state just sort of slides in there. And mm-hmm. if we just surrender power to the collective, life is just going to be so wonderful. You know, they they yeah. they take the same needs. They they're, they're trying to answer the same um, issues, but removing anything that smacks. <laughs> Yeah, you know, of 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 an otherworldly, you know, presence, uh, you know, displacing it with the state. You, you can see how that would how that would work. Yeah, and what's fascinating is, I mean, one's just I think is is um, far fetched to believe as the other. We stand as <laughs> yeah. modern human beings, you yeah. know, shaking our head, going tisk tisk. How could they believe in a divine human? While yeah. at the same time, we just kind of attribute yeah. the exact same. Uh, characteristics to, to a utopian, to, state. To a, to a utopian <laughs> state that just doesn't even exist, right? I mean, it's just a, a, a kind of a, a psychological creation in our minds, but uh, we say, oh, no, this is what intelligent people believe in, right? So, I mean, I, th- I think it is fascinating how we are still looking for those similar uh, qualities as human beings in, in a fallen world. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. What what about Mesopotamia? I mean, because you know, obviously, you're going to have prophets, mm-hmm. uh, especially the biblical prophets. You know, the major and minor that are going to touch in some way. Again, depending on their own historical circumstances, uh, they're going to they're going to be involved in some way with Egyptian motifs. Again, yeah. just depending what the, the historical circumstances are. But you also get a lot that interact with, you know, Assyrian, later Babylonian and Persian uh, motifs, just again, because of the historical circumstance. So how are those, how how are the Mesopotamian views of kingship, how are they similar or different than what you just talked about with the Egyptians? Yeah, that's that's great. Um, You know, I like to to think about this really in in a bit of a chronological stream, because um, if you look at the earliest kind of... um, culture of Mesopotamia, you look at the Sumerian culture, there's a very strong connection between uh, kind of trees and kings. I mean, there's mm-hmm. uh, some some explicit uh, figurations with shulgi and, um, you know, just the, the king is a tree planted by a ditch. I mean, just kind of very explicit mm-hmm. uh, metaphorical language. We have a lot of cylinder, we have a lot of seals uh, from that time, cylinder seals that kind of portray uh, the king in this um uh, uh, replacing the tree. And, and so there's a very strong tradition in Sumerian culture of associating the, the king with a tree. And as that culture, you know, trend kind of um, goes through various transformations through um, the Syrians and the Babylonian uh, you know, hegemony in Mesopotamia, you, you do see some, some various changes. But by the time of the Neo-Assyrian period, 
kind of the idea of the the sacred tree or some type of stylized tree becomes incredibly important politically, so much so that uh, Astronauter Paul's kind of throne room in the the palace at um, the Northwest Palace at Nimrud that was lined with these uh, stylized trees that many scholars have said became almost emblematic of his reign and kingship. So that kingship itself became very visually associated with um, kind of a, a sacred tree or some type of stylized tree. Now, what's the significance of that tree? You know, there, therein lies a lot of good scholarly debate. Um, but you, you certainly see a strong uh, kind of a uh, flow of, of ideas through Mesopotamia um, that pick up that are picked up in iconography later in the Neo-Syrian period. But then you also have some literary examples like, uh, you know, I mean, much could be said about the Epic of Gilgamesh. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. one of the most popular works in the ancient Near East for centuries. I mean, just based on what we know about the copying and um, use of Gilgamesh, it was a literary work that just had enormous influence over the way that ancients thought in Mesopotamia. And we have these wonderful stories about um, uh, Gilgamesh ascending to the cedar forest and doing Mm -hmm. battle with Humbaba, the god of the cedar forest, and conquering the cedar forests. Um, and chopping down the cedars and, and shipping them back to build palaces and, and um, uh, temples and, and those types of things. So, so a very strong um, kind well, of even, tree imagery throughout yeah. Mesopotamia. You know, even, even that, even the act of cutting them down and shipping them to build palaces and temples. Uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, you've, I'm sure you've read it. You probably, it's not like you memorized it. So I don't know <laughs> how, how, what what space this occupies in your head, but uh, Lipinski has this really fascinating article on uh, Mount Hermon mm-hmm. and its relationship to uh, you know the Mesopotamian Garden of the Gods, the Cosmic Mountain, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and and tracing the roots all the way back to Sumer that this is the this was the place where the Divine Council was, and tree imagery is a big part of that. Gilgamesh is a big part of that. It's really fascinating, but if if you're believing that, if you're believing that this place or maybe some, you know, some part of you know Byblos or the the anti Lebanon or up there where Hermon is, yeah. When when you take trees from that place, and you bring them to wherever you're at, and you build temples and palaces with it, I mean that creates an association. Absolutely. You know, it, it's like it's like yeah. divine building material. Yes. You know, so there, there's there's cosmic geography, you know, involved in that, but it, it it sort of even transcends the cosmic geography. Now you're taking elements out of a place that has a certain number of associations, certain kinds of associations, and you're 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 recreating, mm. you know, the, this the, even the whole idea of recreation with with this kind of material. I mean, if you if this is your worldview, you can't help but understand or see what the connections are, mm-hmm. you know, that, that you're, you're doing this intentionally, yeah. you know, to, to create the, the, the linkage. Well, and what I think, you know, one thing that's really fascinating that I discovered in, in researching this book was the um, kind of the, the political significance of gardens created by Mesopotamian kings um, mm-hmm. so that the garden, I mean, uh, based on, you know, in, inscriptional evidence that we have, we know that these kings would actually dig up trees from the foreign lands that they conquer and bring them back and yeah. plant them in their garden so that their palace garden, their temple garden actually became kind of like this miniature of their empire, including all of the the vegetation, all of the trees, so that you could walk through um, the garden and the greater the variation of trees, the greater the the variation of of plants and and flora and fauna indicated the vastness of the empire. It was was kind of this symbol of um, this is what we rule. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you, do you think that that can be sort of, again, like cosmic geography in reverse, where because it's a tree being moved from one place to the other and the, and the trees are going to be associated with deity, 
that now, oh, the, this conquered region's deities are now either submissive to or they've joined the club over here, you know, with, with our pantheon. Is there any of that going on? You know, I think so. Um, I, I think certainly, you know, Gilgamesh lends us in that direction. It seems like by the time of the Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian period, these trees kind of – they they seem to have more significance as a sign of opulence and wealth and prestige and perhaps not so much of a, a theological, mm-hmm. um, you know, I've conquered the tree god uh, type of, of idea. But certainly um, that, that points us back to this continual, uh, you know, mythopoeic use of the garden of yahweh the garden of gods the 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 location of the divine council i mean there there certainly does seem to be something significant i mean why else would solomon spend so much time and energy building his palace and the temple out of mm-hmm. the cedars of lebanon i mean there these were the most sought after trees in all of the ancient near east and solomon like every other king before him and after him wanted his palace to be the palace of the 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 palace of cedars right as we're told in in first kings mm-hmm. um so i mean there is a lot of um i, I do think there's a lot of uh, kind of political significance in building with these materials they were seen as fine they were seen as precious they would in, inspire awe in people who would come to see them but i do think there is something uh to say this this is kind of sacred ground, you know, I mean, this is Mm -hmm. where you go to interact with uh, the precious things of this world. And and there probably is some theological overtone uh, that's that's carried over, but it's it's hard to say by the time you get down into the Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian period, how much of that uh, kind of residual Mesopotamian mythology is still driving that political that political agenda. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you got Psalm 48, you know, with the, with the Tzaphon language, mm-hmm. you know, uh, with attributed to Zion. I mean, if, if, if Solomon had a good theological propagandist, you know, you, you could make a lot of, a, a lot out of where the trees come from because yes. now, you know, we're, we are, this is a, this is sort of a sign act yeah. that the temple of Yahweh is the seat of the gods, you know, the, he is, he's the most high and, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you could, mm-hmm. the, these things you're doing overtly, you know, for, for essentially public consumption and, and maybe, maybe priestly consumption and maybe you're the king and you believe it too, you know, that, mm-hmm. that whole yeah. sort of thing. But, it, but these, these can be conceived of as sign acts. And in Solomon's case, you, he could actually turn that into a theological polemic that sounded really good. Yeah, you know, the supremacy of Yahweh. When you know, we all know that Solomon's just going to go off in in crazy places. You know, with with his intermarriage and political alliances and all that sort of stuff. But again, if if you had a good theological propagandist, you could make that case. <laughs> well, you know, you know what's interesting is there are texts. Uh, I think um, I want to say like uh, Hittite text and um, that talk about the king requiring permission. From the gods to chop mm-hmm. down yeah, there you the go. trees, and 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 it was it, the king. It, you know, the king had to um, kind of receive this divine ability to mm-hmm. harvest the trees to do that. And I mean, it's kind of interesting because we are we're told in scripture that I mean, David was specifically forbidden to build um, the palace, and Solomon is is commissioned to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you still have that same idea of like God is saying, okay, yes, you're the one who's going to build me a temple, and um, and it's it's the cedars of Lebanon that are going to provide the the backbone of that temple. And, um, you know, we can turn to other places in Scripture, especially, you know, Ezekiel 31, like I'll be talking about in the conference, Mm -hmm. uh, where we see direct reference to the cedars that are in the Garden of Yahweh. So it is the very trees that Ezekiel 31 talks about that are making up the habitation of Yahweh Mm -hmm. in in 1 Kings. So let's let's talk about trees. What what was it about a tree that that made it? sort of an appealing, again, I don't know if these are the right terms, but an appealing yeah. metaphor or an appropriate metaphor. Because again, I, I look at it, I try to tend, you know, I, I tend to, to try to look at things simplistically. Okay. If I'm in an arid culture mm-hmm. and I see a good looking healthy tree, I'm thinking, well, 
you know, there's got to be water around here yeah. somewhere. This this might be a good place to to camp out for a while. Yeah. Uh, and and the stronger it is, you know, I'm I'm going to be again propelled by that thought that there's there's look, look this this area sustains this tree somehow. Yeah. So so there's going to be other living things here. This is going to, this is going to be good for me. I, I will be able to survive here. And then you have the whole tall tree, you know, connecting heaven and earth kind of stuff. So build on those thoughts a little bit and then, you know, whatever direction you want to take it. But what, you know, what was the big deal with the tree? Yeah. How, no, how is that appropriate? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. And I think it's actually a really important question for those of us living in North America because um, our kind of geographical, topographical realities in North America can oftentimes run opposite to what you see mm-hmm. in, in Israel in, in the ancient Near East. Yeah. And, yeah, and we, that, we have an interstate highway system and trucks. You know? Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, like in the sense of, um, like where where I live, I mean, well, right now I'm in I'm in North Carolina, and um, the higher up you go in the Mount Appalachian Mountains in North Carolina, the more sparse it becomes. Mm-hmm. The the when you go down, um, it becomes more lush and green. Um, but in Israel, it's not always that case. It's not really the case because a lot of times, the lower you are in elevation, the more desertification yeah. has happened. I mean, the drier, the more arid it is, and the higher you go the greener it becomes because the temperatures are cooler. They're more temperate and you get these beautiful forests and, and creeks and streams. And so it, it's, it's kind of strange, I think, for us sometimes to think that, okay, going up is actually encountering the forest. Going down will might could possibly drive you into you know, the, the Arabian desert or somewhere that's incredibly hot and dry with, with little source of life. Um, and so for the ancient Israelites specifically, you know, um, to go up to Jerusalem was to walk up um, into the the central highlands of of the Levant. I mean, it's it's forested. It's it's very green, um, and so there was very much, I think, this idea in the ancient world. I mean, where there were trees, there was life. There was shade. There was water. Uh, there was. It wasn't. It wasn't hostile. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that was uh, very much at the heart of, of of this idea. Not to try to explain away all of the the. Um, inspired nature of the biblical text, but I do think that there was something that really resonated with the ancient mind. Um, I remember the first time uh, when I was in Israel and I went to En Gedi, which is mm-hmm. next to the Dead Sea. I mean, you just talk about the, a stark contrast. The Dead Sea is just, I mean, as barren as you can imagine. And then you walk into En Gedi and it's this natural spring and it looks like you've been transported immediately to a tropical jungle. You know, mm-hmm. there's there's just green everywhere and all because there's water, there's water that sustains it. There's trees that are growing up. It's life in the middle of the desert. And I just think it's that stark contrast that really just fueled this type of tree imagery and, I mean, uh, really provided much of the poetic grist for the biblical prophets and the poets of the Old Testament. I mean, it really is a picture of death to life when you walk from um, just sand and dirt as far as the eye can see to a spring that's exploding with different shades of green and flowers and water. Um, and, and many of the, the tree images that we encounter in the Bible are connected to the source of water. So, I mean, we're told mm-hmm. several times that where either personification or, or something, I mean, think about the classic example in Psalm 1, right? A tree planted by streams of water. I mean, the ancient world, they didn't think trees just sprung up out of nowhere. They oftentimes <laughs> associated that tree with its water source. And that water source becomes quite theological in and of itself as uh, being kind of a, a, a metaphorical portrayal of Yahweh, of of His blessing, uh, of of those ways that that Yahweh would sustain that individual. Yeah, the, these these isolated little places are are glimpses of of uh, you know where the gods are. You know, they're, yeah. and 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 the god, you know, the gods, or you know, in the case of biblical thinking, you know, the God of Israel. The, 
you, you mentioned that this is this is life and death. You know, this counter position. You know, they're they're the source of life. Well, if you don't believe that, go visit. You know, their You know, I mean, yeah. What what better place could there possibly be? You know, so it it becomes this sort of you know reinforcing uh, metaphor to you know again pun intended here, but to implant mm -hmm. uh, the idea that that the divine presence is where life is. It's not barren. It's not death. You know, the, yeah. it, and so if you want to live. This is where you want to be, and you, and you want to be, uh, you know, in the presence of, in sync with, you know, this this deity, you know, the, uh, either the god of the Bible or the gods of somebody else, because they have power of life and death, yeah. And and the and the environment itself is proof of that, you know, to the ancient mind. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, these are not separated realities in in many ways. So where you see life. In, in its fullness, well, why would you – I mean that would be the – Why wouldn't the, you want the, that? That Yeah, that's kind of the, <laughs> the domain of the, the deity, and I think you certainly see that with many of the the traditions that emerge in the Old Testament that kind of point Yahweh's residence back to the lofty mountains of Lebanon and these beautiful – uh, mountains full of these trees that were awe-inspiring, that were refreshing, that just looked like vibrance and life. Um, yes, that is what we think of. When, I mean, and, that that is that yeah. is Yahweh, right? Yeah, and and to take it back to kingship, well, the, the the guy sitting on the throne, you know, with all with all the women in his harem, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know all these pejorative stereotypes, but the the guy sitting on on the throne there is again. You've been taught that he's an extension of that. So if you want life to be all it could be, if you want, you know, in, in any way to get along in life and have, you know, something that that to you at least would feel like a good life, you're going to obey. You know, you're, you're you're going to align yourself with him, align your will with him, you know, because he is the one that holds all of these things in place. You know, to displace him, you know, to to make trouble for him, is not only going to be a personal threat, but it's going to be a threat to your own family, to your own extended family, to your town, you know, to your city. You know, you just there's this ripple effect because everything is viewed as connected to this guy, who is connected to the real source of life, you know, God or the gods. Absolutely, and in a way that is almost a bit unnerving. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, it is kind of creepy, <laughs> you know, one of the I mean, one of the the realities that you just are, are kind of smacked in the face with when you read through um, the the biblical literature from the divided monarchy. Right. Um, from the, the time of the, the prophets is you just really don't learn a lot about the life of the average Israelite or Judean during the time of the prophets. I mean, the prophets. I mean, there's a few times where you you have them, you know, like Amos giving speeches at a temple, where obviously there were some bystanders and you know some some other phenomena. But most of the time, the prophets are dealing with two types of people: prophets and kings. And mm -hmm. you know, the the nation really is is not addressed, and and that I mean. At, at that much. I mean, you might have some direct address to the people, but we don't really know what's going on on the ground uh, mm -hmm. during this time. And, and it just, I think it highlights the significance of um, that the reality that the Bible states, and that is, so goes the king, so goes the nation. When the, the, the king responds in faithfulness to Yahweh, uh, then the nation is blessed. When the king rebels against Yahweh and creates foreign alliances with Egypt or Assyria or whoever it is, the nation as a whole is punished. Um, and with all of the, the ethical intricacies that emerge from that, it shows us, however, how important the role of king is to the future stability and vitality of the nation. And so just as these wicked kings really – or the Deuteronomist, you know, first and second kings want us to realize that it's the wicked kings that prompted the destruction and exile of Israel. In the same way, Yahweh is going to have a new king, and that new king is going to establish his world order and on his holy mountain, and, and frequently that new king is also portrayed with – a young sapling or a mm -hmm. a small um, insignificant looking shoot something that's not very inspiring not very powerful looking 
but that this young new growth of Yahweh's planting is going to be his king that will establish his world order on his holy mountain, something that these other kings have failed to do. Yeah, all that all that stuff, you know, the, the stump, the branch. Yeah. Um it, it it's it's connected back to the tree, you know, imagery. I mean, again, yeah. this what what I'm hoping listeners, you know, get out of this is this is intentional. Okay, the the, the, the stuff that happens in the Hebrew Bible, and of course, in regards to other things, just in the Bible generally, they're not trying to fill space. It's like, oh, well, I need to vary my vocabulary here so I don't get a D on this paper. You know, it just, it, it, it's not random. It's not um, just sort of peripheral. They're doing these things intentionally to conjure certain thoughts in the mind of the reader. Again, a, a reader that is that is actually connected to this world. Uh, that that they're going to be able to process things like stump, branch, you know, the sapling. They're they're going to know how to orient that, you know, in, in the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. And and we we just sort of miss that thing. But uh, again, on this podcast, you know, we are constantly harping on the intentionality of the biblical writers. That that God, you know, prepared the biblical writers in the way that He did. He picks them out of the culture that He did. I mean, God knows what He's getting when He picks these people. And and he has providentially prepared them, and and they are equipped to communicate something very intentional, very specific to their audience. And yeah, we're disconnected from that, but it's our job to try to get back into that world so that we can process, you know, scripture better. And and this is a very simple example. We're all familiar with this branch language with Messiah and and the, and the line of David. But there you go. It, it's part of the, the, the tree, the, the matrix of ideas associated with tree imagery, which is associated with kingship. Yeah, I mean, in fact, I would go so far as to say that when the prophets of Israel are grasping for their kind of preferred stock metaphor or stock image of talking about royal figures, uh, both contemporary and future and messianic, they reach for this kind of working uh, metaphor of the tree as a king, um, that this kind of relationship between talking about kingship as a as a tree that has branches that shadow the land and provide shade as a, a dynasty that has roots that reach down as a tree that is nourished by the divine springs of Yahweh. I mean, all of these ideas are wrapped up in this kind of working uh, cultural idea. And for us, it's really, I think, important, as you were saying, to to kind of tease that out because the significance of figurative language is that it's bringing together two worlds that don't normally exist. Mm-hmm. And, and the only way that that – Figuration or that metaphor or simile makes sense to us is when there's shared knowledge. And I sometimes use the example of uh, one of my colleagues had a <laughs> his son had a favorite saying for a while. He would say that he was fast as a lemon, <laughs> and I, I would always say, you know, either he. He he must know something about lemons that I <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, so metaphors and some well, there's some break, other layer to yeah, that. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they break down when there's not a shared understanding, and so this is really the study of of imagery and metaphor in the Hebrew Bible. Is I think one of the places where our knowledge of ancient culture can really just become so profitable in helping us establish those connections of shared understanding to where when we read that, yes, Yahweh is going to uh, take this young shoot and it's going to grow up and we can go, okay, that's not just a random image. That has an enormous, you know, kind of cultural, um, uh, you know, um, yeah, a, a huge cultural currency that the mm-hmm. reader would be going, okay, this is Yahweh's yep. new dynasty. This is Yahweh's new king. This is yeah, they're they're picking up what he's laying down. That's it's right. Like, it just yeah. goes right over our heads. Yeah, yeah. That that's really important. You actually gave a little bit of an infomercial there for uh, John Hilber's session at the Naked Bible Conference. Oh, okay. Sorry. He's going to do it. No, well, no, that's <laughs> it's great because he's. His talk is about why a, a, a quote unquote literal hermeneutic should not be our default. And it's it's this kind of thing, you know, this this disconnection with metaphor really harms our ability to understand scripture. 
it's really important. What do you think about, um, you know, something else you, you just said? I mean, there's this, the tree language here. Nobody, nobody in, in the Israelite world is going to read that and be confused by it. They're not going to think, oh, that's kind of odd. You know, why would you pick that? You know, they're, they're just going to know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think about, this is kind of a, a, a broader perspective that you get in other cultures, and you get a little bit of it in the ancient Near East. And of, and of course, there are places in the Hebrew Bible where you run into it, but the whole world tree idea, the, 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 the tree is a good metaphor because it reaches to the heavens and it's connected to the earth. Yeah, so you have this heaven and earth intersection, and you can even press it to, well, a tree is actually you know, penetrating the earth too, so it even connects to Sheol. And, you, know, mm-hmm. you, you have all this kind of stuff going on. In, your, in the course of your book, you know, how much of that specific you know, idea factors into kingship? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I certainly think that when you look at the various cultures across, especially the ancient Near East, you do see some just kind of similar themes emerging as as kind of the this this large tree um, stretching from from heaven to earth. And in fact, I think that there is, especially in the Hebrew Bible, a another metaphor that's working alongside this tree metaphor um that is height is Mm -hmm. arrogance um or height is extending to the heavens right Mm -hmm. the the heavens is the 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 place where god dwells and and reigns and so you know uh isaiah chapter two right i mean in isaiah chapter two every high thing is going to be brought down (laughs) and it's like well Really? I mean, just everything that's high, a ship mast is going to be judged because – yes, because – and I think the idea there is that you you have this metaphor of height equals arrogance and hubris. It's as though anything that's tall that's extending into the heavens is seeking to occupy the place or the space of God, and that gets mm-hmm. tied up very closely with the, the tree imagery and kingship so that any king that is going to um, be a great tree – or in Ezekiel, you don't even have to be a tree. I mean Ezekiel kind of uh, takes up Isaiah's vine imagery and you know talks about a vine that does what trees do. Uh, the vine grows to the heavens and extends its branches out, providing shade and protection and these types of things. But once your top is in the heavens, um, you know, there's a lot of potential for, for trouble, especially in the, the Hebrew Bible. Oftentimes that's the precursor of arrogance of look what I've done, look what I've become, at which point Yahweh steps in and says, no, this is my domain you will be judged for your arrogance and your your hubris. So, I mean, I, I, at one level, I think you you really can't avoid the reality of this kind of world tree idea that there is um, this this tree that stands as this figure planted by Yahweh um, to extend and to establish His world order. Um, but oftentimes, that idea kind of gets. Uh, Turned on its head, or quite literally chopped down mm-hmm. by the prophets because of the the pride and hubris of the nations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we don't want to we don't want to go too far into that because of the the Daniel four, and I know that's mm. that's conference turf. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, <laughs> but but there you, but, yeah. I mean, you you really get it there too. Yeah, absolutely. What what do you make of uh, Asherah? You know, and and you you have of course tree symbology. Mm-hmm. There is. Is there a, is there some sort of rivalry going on there? Um, did you get into that at all? Like why why would that be her symbol? Why did the Israelites seem seemingly adopt it so easily, and even in some cases transfer it uh, to Yahweh in some conceptual way? Is is the reason that that could and did happen? Is the link there the tree? Was that was that just too close of an association? What what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, when you start looking at um, the use of Asherah and Asherim um, in in the Old Testament, I mean, I, I do think that a lot of those references are um, in in our Hebrew Bibles are specifically speaking about a stylized tree 
you know, when I say stylized, I'm talking about like a tree that has been pruned to a kind of a unique shape, mm -hmm. like a, you know, a, a sacred type of, of tree that is either alive or possibly even dead. That's, that's put in a, a sacred location, like on top of a mountain, you know, we've got our, uh, references in Jeremiah, the people worshiping wood and stone. Um, I, I think that what you have there is is the people of Israel just kind of embracing the, the the cultural symbols of Canaanite worship, which were, you know, of course, Baal and Asherah, and um, and conflating those with Yahweh. I mean, we we see um, theological conflation happen with the people coming out of Egypt, making the golden calves. Um, Here are your gods, O Yahweh. It happens again with, with Jeroboam the first. I mean, we know that it's not far-fetched for the people of Israel to kind of uh, have this theological conflation of, okay, we have Yahweh, but we're going to represent him the way that the cultures around us do. We want to mm -hmm. see Yahweh. We want something physical and tangible that we can bow down and worship. And just as the tree was a significant sacred object in Egyptian worship uh, and Mesopotamian context, I think it's also you know it was also a significant object in Canaanite worship before Israel even got into the land of Canaan. All right. One of the things that would pop into a you know a listener's head would be, well, well, shouldn't they have known better? Because you're not supposed to make a graven image of anything you know, you know, in the earth or under the earth, or you know, because Yahweh is so unlike anything else in creation. So shouldn't they have known? Hey, we shouldn't be making tree objects here. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how how would you address that? Well, I mean, I think in in one sense, I don't know how much um, Israel was associating Yahweh with the Asherah pole or the tree. I mean, there are a few inscriptions that you know I deal with in the book from Kintelet Ashrud mm -hmm. and and other places where you have references to Yahweh and his Asherah, mm -hmm. um, which could be talking about Yahweh and his consort or, or something along those other lines. Um, as far as the, the text goes, I don't know. There's really only one place in the Hebrew Bible, and that's in Hosea 14, where Yahweh himself is actually kind of directly associated with a tree. In all other places, the references to Asherah or Baal and his Asherah. Um, so, I mean, it's the question like, you know, didn't Israel know that this was wrong? Um, you know, one of the ways that I talk about idolatry, especially during um, – Israel's occupation in the land of Canaan is it's so easy for us standing on on this side of history to look back and just go, gosh, what is wrong yeah. with them? You know, I mean, when everybody has a Bible, you know, yeah, just yeah. like the ancient Israel. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, just to say, like, golly, couldn't they figure it out? Um, but you know, the, the the difficult things about idols, both then and now, is they're deeply culturally embedded, and they're not easy to see when you're in that culture. And, um, you know, when Israel went into the land of Canaan, I, I don't I don't believe that the main threat that the Canaanites were posing was, you know, do away with Yahweh. Um, because more than likely, I mean, the Canaanites were polytheistic or certainly henotheistic. It was not your God's not real. It is if you want to experience life and thrive in the land of Canaan, you better pay homage to the gods of Canaan. If you want to worship Yahweh on your own, you know, you've got your Sunday morning Yahweh service, that's fine. But if you want to live in this land, you better pay homage to Baal and his Asherah. And, you know, I mean, we can come up with all kinds of, of contemporary narratives that say, yeah, you know, you want to worship your God on Sunday, that's fine. But if you want to experience life in its fullness in the land of America, you too better worship X, right? You too better worship this. And and so I think that we can fall prey to those same henotheistic tendencies um, that, that Israel did, and um, that the, the monotheism of the Bible doesn't say that, you know, God is um, the greatest of all of these other gods. They exist, and you need to pay homage to them at times. It is that Yahweh is Lord alone. Yeah, the, the cultural embedding is, is an important thing because it I mean, let, let's be realistic here. Not everybody has access to scripture. We, we, and we had, even beyond that, we don't even know necessarily what existed when in, in, in certain circumstances. So does the material exist? If it exists, how is it being disseminated, if at all? Mm -hmm. And if you get, like in the divided monarchy, if you get a situation in where, the, you know, you get a king in there and, and he's putting up the Asherah pole 
or, or some other object and says, well, this is how we worship Yahweh here. In yeah. 20 years, in 30 years, in 40 years, you have, you have a generational slippage. Absolutely. You know, the yeah. old generation is going to die out that remembered, well, we shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. And the new generation grew up with it. So, yeah. you know, how, how are they supposed to know what to do or not to do? And, you know, the biblical answer is, well, you know, God raises up a prophet. This guy runs around, and starts yelling at people about the covenant. And, <laughs> and, and yeah. but, if, but again, if, if you just grew up with these, with the trappings of this, and then you go out and you listen to this guy, and it's like, well, why should I listen to the wild man? You know, why? It's a real question in your mind. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and again, in, in, you know, in the biblical context, which again, biblical material is selective, there are going to be occasions where the wild man turns out to do a miracle or the wild man challenges the, you know, your, this deity or, or the king or whatever. And, and there's, there's some act of power that, that draws your attention. To, well, maybe we ought to listen to the wild man because look at that. Yeah. You know, it, I mean, you, you have these, these kinds of, points of interference where God will intervene, you know, to, to keep a remnant alive, you know, that, that whole point of biblical thinking. Mm -hmm. But it, it isn't hard to imagine when people don't have access to truth. And, and isn't that a trajectory we could, we could pursue even in the, in the age of information. So much of Absolutely. the information we have access to is just nonsense and garbage. But when people are cut off from that, or they can't filter it, they can't filter out the noise. Mm. Yeah. Then, when when you when you have a, a exposed a generation to that and you go 10 15 20 25 years down the road now what are you going to do you know it it just changes the, the the picture completely so i i try not to be too hard nosed about what people are doing not to call evil good and, and all that kind of stuff but you you can understand that it's not really a question of intelligence absolutely it's not that they're stupid and and we're so smart it's that they they don't they really don't have access to to what they should be thinking, or or the alternative. They, you know, they it, it's 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 really an access you know question. Yeah. It's not an intelligence question. Well, that's one of the reasons, Mike. I mean, I really appreciate your vision with uh, the podcast and just the many uh, you know areas and ways in which you're trying to um, help people grow in their understanding. I mean, as a college professor, I see year after year after year after year what I can anticipate students coming into a basic Bible class understanding is just getting smaller and smaller and smaller mm -hmm. and smaller, you know, and, and, and you're right. It's not a matter of, it's not a matter of intelligence. It's a matter of exposure and it's a matter of exposure to good information. And um, the reality is that, I mean, many people have noted just the, the rise of biblical illiteracy in the American church and the ability to to interact with just the, the information of the Old Testament and the New Testament um, so that, yeah, I mean, I think you're exactly right. It's not a matter of is this, are, are people intelligent or not? It's, it's what do they have access to as far as information yeah. goes and how do we – in this in this information age where you can get tons of information help people begin to decipher what's true good and beautiful in a world that they are bombarded by lots of noise yeah chances are they they would think better thoughts if we gave them better things to think about yes you know that, that doesn't seem to be rocket science <laughs> <laughs> You know, but it's a it's a real problem. I, I have one more question before yeah. we we wrap up. Now, this is something I just I've been a bit frustrated on. I've not really found anything. I've just haven't found much information at all. Commentators just don't seem to really drill down on this to my satisfaction. And I, I'm not asking for a dissertation. I'm just asking for a really good article. I mean, it, mm -hmm. but I haven't been able to find it. And that is the the. The uh, seventy trees, you know, the the a, at Aileen, the, the place Aileen. Mm. You know, you have this oasis, you got the trees. It, it it just seems that there's something going on here. You've got the number seventy, you know, and again, even the wordplay with Aileen being a plural, you know, of gods. You know, I, I know I know you have a homograph issue, or or I guess do you? Um, but you can see water, the gardens, the trees, the number seventy. It just seems like this is there's there's this is divine counsel stuff here, but I have yeah. not found anybody that has really drilled down on that. So I'm wondering in your research about trees, did you ever come across anything useful 
about the oasis there at Aileem and the 70, you know, trees? Uh, you know, I think I, I, I look at it briefly in the book. Um, I mean, one of the things that you do notice in um, – in the Bible is that especially early on in the the patriarchal narratives, um, there seems to be this overlap of kind of sacred sites. You mm-hmm. know, um, especially Shechem. Shechem has a, a pretty significant role to play, and it seems as though there's kind of a sacred grove at Shechem. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so, yeah, I mean. I am okay with the people of Israel kind of theologically usurping these um, perceived sacred locations as they come to understand them through their um, Yahwistic perspective. You know, like they they encounter this site that there seems to be something significantly spiritual about this grove at Shechem. And, you know, this seems like a place that we too should worship, that, that we should worship Yahweh here. Um, and so, you know, when we get to the, this, um, this moment here at, at Elim with the 12 springs and the 70 palm trees, um, you know, there's just there's just so there's, much packed into that. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, you know, numerically and, and, and symbolism there, um, but it's it's hard. I don't know, you know, I mean, it's it's hard to say beyond that what's yeah, uh, it, what's happening. Yeah, like I just haven't found anything on the history of the place, you know, and then I realize it's even, you know, who knows if they can identify it, and you know, you, you run into all sorts of problems there, but. Mm-hmm. It it seems pretty clearly to be a place associated with either divine encounter or, again, the the abode of the gods because you got these divine council trappings, you know, there. Yeah. And and the twelve is really significant because of the number of the tribes. Tribes. Yeah. You know, it, it there's there's got to be something going on there, uh, but <laughs> I, I just haven't found anything that really sort of like wow, you know, somebody actually did the work here. Yeah, I think you know, as, as we're all uh, as, as biblical scholars, you know, we're we're all kind of all scared to to take that step. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> there's something there, and I'm going to leave it for the next guy to figure out. But well, I, uh, you, you know, know I, I think you're right. It just it just seems that it's it's sort of you know pregnant with these motifs, mm-hmm. and uh, again, I I don't know that you can get you know, a, a, a good article out of it because there just doesn't seem to be a lot of supporting material to it. Yeah. But, you know, who knows? So I, well, I mean, I think you certainly could, you can build on the idea of, uh, the, the theological significance of, of water and trees. Yeah. And yeah. then when you, when you look at the significance of, uh, water and trees together with the numerical, you know, numbers of 12, the, the tribes of Israel and the 70, palm trees i mean it does seem to be a um a, a very significant um theological respite that the people are experiencing before they are sent out uh into the wilderness of sin right mm-hmm. i mean it's a picture that uh, if we if we want to make that association between the springs and israel that god has you know he's he's providing blessing um for his people and um the the trees are uh, you know, a perfect shelter for them, uh, 70 mm-hmm. of them, or, you know, I mean, I think I, I would, maybe, maybe we'll resort to gematria at one. Yeah. Day, yeah. So. I don't know. I mean, well, that's, and that's, that's where, you know, and that's where I, I, I guess I kind of pull up on the range. I said, well, <laughs> right. you know, I don't want to go down the, the path of gematria yeah. and start doing some midrash here on 1527, but yeah, there you know, you I, there's certainly something there, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, thanks for, uh, for being with us. Uh, anything else you want to, um, you know, mention, uh, again, your, your book of course is for sale. Uh, again, this is the kind of thing that, you know, okay, maybe you didn't go to seminary, maybe you didn't go to grad school, but look, there's going to be plenty in this book that you can digest that will, you know, put lots of, lots of seed thoughts. Again, there's another pun, yeah. uh, in your head, you know, so that you can be thinking better about kingship and, and why the Bible does all this tree stuff. I mean, even with the Messiah, again, you, yeah. you get these, you get these metaphors and, and extensions of metaphors and they're actually intentional and they mean something. So this is the kind of book that you're going to benefit a lot from it. You may not pick up everything in it, but who cares? You know, there's, 
it's going to be one of the best things out there for this. So of Trees and Kings, Comparative Analysis of Tree Imagery in Israel's Prophetic Tradition of the Ancient Near East. That's Eisenbronze. It is available uh, on Amazon. If you go up to the site, you'll notice that they the, the, the publisher hasn't put a picture, a cover picture there. Don't worry. It is for sale. I have proof of that. Uh, I have, Like I said, I have one sitting on my desk. <laughs> yeah. It's real. It's real. So again, it's a good resource to recommend, but it, are there any online resources that, that you have found might be useful for metaphor or an iconography and stuff like this, just real quickly? Uh, as far as online resources, oh goodness, no, it's um, that is tough. You know, this might sound really bad, but I would almost kind of encourage people to stay away from online <laughs> free of life resources. Right. Um <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, in all honesty, I mean, it is it is kind of a a, a hot topic with with yeah. with people that um, like to to kind of grab things and, and run. Oh, um, I, I would encourage people if you can uh, get your hands on. Um, uh, uh, there's a great book by uh, William Brown called Seeing the Psalms, in which he kind of oh. walks through metaphor and um, and various uh, kind of meta- metaphors that are picked up in the Psalms. And one of those, he's got a fabulous tra- chapter on tree metaphors in the Psalms that kind of is, is going in similar ways, but just a, a really good... Um, yeah, that, that's a good recommendation. Uh, and it's very readable, uh, seeing the Psalms by William Brown. And yeah. uh, I mean, for the more technically uh, inclined, uh, you know, Brent Strawn, Isaac de Hilster, and and others have put together a fabulous book called Iconographic Exegesis of mm-hmm. the Hebrew Bible, mm-hmm. um, an introduction to its methods and practice, which is kind of a, a, a really um, good volume in exploring how we – uh, associate ancient iconographic images with our understanding of the biblical text, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's. It, yeah. I would actually encourage uh, listeners to to push into that because I find that um, that there's a lot of room for error when people start saying, "See, look at this image from the ancient world. See this biblical text." Mm-hmm. Voila, right? Um, there's not always a clear cut connection, right? I mean, there's not always a an organic connection. So we need to be careful about how are we using um, images in the ancient world to help us better understand kind of the the, the cognitive worldview of the ancients. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, well, those, you know, those are good. Yeah. Those are good recommendations. I mean, they're they're things people can get. You know, it, it, some of the some of the stuff isn't. I mean, it's it's not exorbitantly expensive. It's not like you know a, a dime paperback or anything like that. If those even sure. exist anymore, but uh, again, catching the drift. You know, if you if you want good resources, they are available, uh, and and again, a lot of them, you know, are are reasonable. And, and mm-hmm. I think those are two of them that would would qualify for that statement. So, yeah, yeah, those, those are good. Well, thanks again for being with us, and we look forward to your session at the conference. Again, you, you, you mentioned Ezekiel 31 and Daniel mm-hmm. 4. Hey, folks, you know, read those chapters, and you're going to see why uh, Rusty's going to focus on those at the Naked Bible Conference. It's going to be good stuff, and honestly, I, I feel quite confident that uh, you're not going to really hear it anywhere else. Um, you know, you don't need to go to grad school. You know, we have people like Rusty, you know, to take us into— See, I, I want to make another pun here to, to lead us into the forest. <laughs> it's just, well, it's, it's just getting bad. We need, we yeah. Need to hopefully, we don't off. lose the lose the forest for the trees, right? <laughs> right. That's, yeah. There, uh, there's, there's that one. Lose the forest for the trees and all that. Yeah. So no, but but we appreciate your work, and again, you're you're trying to um, you know teach it not only in your classes but just participating in the conference to make it accessible. Absolutely. Yeah, it's right. been great. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate being with you and uh, being a part of the conference, and look forward to it. Yep. Thank you. All right, Mike. Well, I'm really looking forward to Rusty diving deeper into it at the conference. And again, go to nakedbibleconference.com to get your tickets. Uh, we, I think we have about 50 tickets left, so mm-hmm. don't wait. Please uh, go get Rusty's book, Trees and Kings. It's on Amazon and uh, you'll be ready for the conference come August 18th. Yeah, absolutely. And and we're, we're serious. Don't wait because they are disappearing. The tickets are disappearing. Absolutely. We're expecting a full house and we're super excited about that. And uh, we want to thank Rusty for coming on and uh, want to thank everybody else for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. 
Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.